So activity diagrams, you already guessed, they are meant to describe activities, to describe the, the control flow and the information flow in a procedure and in a process. And in Common Cats, we will use this uh, to model uh, what is going on in an organization. Because in a knowledge-based system, uh, the goal is to uh, use knowledge technology to support experts and processes in an, an, uh, an organization. So we need to somehow describe these processes in the organization. So the control flow uh, 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 in these organizations, but also the control flow in the knowledge-based system that we will actually build. So there are really two uses here. One, the, the flow of control of uh, processes in an organization, and one, the flow of control in the system that we are actually going to build. So here's a very simple uh, activity diagram. An activity diagram always has a starting point, and it must have an ending point. These are the notations for that. And in between starting and ending point, there are activities. Uh, and these activities are connected by flows. So that's a very basic structure of a diagram. Now this is a very simple diagram, which is just a linear uh, uh, control flow. Um, but of course, uh, they can be more sophisticated. Uh, one uh, more complicated modeling element is a choice point. So if a state transition, a transition between two different states uh, doesn't have a single outcome, but there is a choice of multiple outcomes, um, then uh, we can introduce a decision point, uh, which is annotated with two possible outcomes or multiple possible outcomes. And depending on the outcome, the control flow takes one or the other direction. Well, we can also have processes that happen concurrently. Um, so for example, suppose that you're cooking your dinner, then your first activity is to buy food and drinks. And then you're going to do two things. You're going to cook the dinner. And while you're cooking the dinner, you're actually already having a drink with your friends. And those two happen in parallel. And this is described by the forking construction. And uh, after two processes run in parallel, they can be synchronized again so that uh, the next process happens after both of the parallel processes have uh, finished. So a fork and a join. Now, processes uh, uh, can be distributed over multiple actors. So in the previous example, with the cooking example, there were actually uh, uh, multiple actors. There was you cooking and you having drinks with your friends. Um, so there is a notation for describing uh, multiple actors where different activities are performed by different actors. And this is uh, donated by the so-called swim lanes. And uh, you see that they are horizontal, oh, sorry, vertical stripes in the diagram. And so they, they, ref they resemble the, the swim lanes uh, in a swimming pool. That's why they're called swim lanes. So we have two swim lanes here. Um, one is the set of activities done by the sales department. And the other one is the activity done by the design department. And the overall flow uh, switches uh, from activities uh, in the sales department to activities in the design department, and then uh, back to activities in the sales department. Uh, so in this case, the sales department gets customer information. It sends this to the design department who have to design a product that is suitable for the customer. And then uh, the design department sends the design back to the uh, sales department um, uh, to uh, describe, uh, to calculate the cost. So you see activity switching between the different actors, and this is uh, written down as activities happening in the different swing lanes. Um, we can also um, communicate between uh, processes. So there are two ways of communicating. One way is that there's actual information objects flowing, and that is what we have seen so far. So this is this notation where a particular information object uh, uh, in this case, the request is being sent from this activity to this activity, from receiving the request to archiving it. Um, but here is a, a signal being sent so that one activity tells the other activity to start. And that this uh, starting 
or stopping is uh, not done by sending an information object, but by simply sending uh, a signal. So that's a different notation uh, for sending an information object or sending a signal. So here is a little bit more realistic example. And in order to explain that example, I need to uh, explain you a little bit about Dutch society. So um, as you know, Dutch society is a, is a, a controlled free market society. So, so we believe in efficiency of the free market, but we also believe that the free market is not the best solution for every possible uh, problem in, uh, in our society. And that some problems are, or some issues are so important that they shouldn't be left to free market mechanisms. And one of those issues is housing. So we don't want housing to be allocated on the base of free market mechanisms only, because that would mean that rich people get big houses and poor people get no houses or only very poor ones. So the housing market is very strictly controlled and they are controlled by housing associations. And we are going to use such a housing association as a running example. So what does a housing association do? Well, maybe some of you has done this in the past already in Amsterdam. So you can become a member of a housing association um, and the housing association owns many houses. And if you're looking for a house and you're a member, then you can look at the houses that are available at a particular month. So when people leave their houses, the housing association has housing available. And as a member, you can subscribe to a magazine where you get or to a website or an email list where you get to see what houses are available and you can register your interest for certain houses. And then the housing association every month tries to match the interested members with the available housing. And this is done on the basis of all kinds of criteria. So, for example, income and how long you have been waiting for a house and the size of your family and the size of the house and maybe the urgency of your situation. So if you're, a, say, a single mother with a child who's just been divorced and is now looking for a, a new home. Um, and so that is the process that's being done by a housing association. And this process can be very easily described in a UML uh, activity diagram. So we have uh, the, the, the primary and the secondary process, which you could call the front office and the, and the back office. Um, and this is already de uh, depicted in the two swim lanes. So let's look at what happens in the primary swim lane. So at the beginning of the process, uh, the housing association uh, makes uh, uh, it produces a magazine where uh, it uh, describes what uh, houses are available for that particular month. And then that magazine is being sent to the applicants and then the applicants can register their interest. So there is a data entry activity uh, where uh, the housing association has to register the interests of all its applicants. And then these uh, registered interest applications they're being used to assess these applications. Of course, there is in a typical month, there is more interest than there are houses. So we have to somehow assess these applications, which ones are more urgent or more important and so on. Um, based on these application assessments, the housing association uh, makes uh, an assignment of these residences. So then these uh, uh, assignments uh, are being made. And based on these assignments and the available housing in the next month, we go back to producing uh, the new magazine. So this is the primary uh, process in, uh, of the housing association. And for purposes of uh, statistics keeping and record keeping uh, and being a publicly transparent organization, they do statistical analysis. How many houses do they have available? How many are oversubscribed? How many go to different groups of populations? So whenever there is a set of assignments available, they send this to the secondary process, where a secondary process does a statistical analysis, which is then being used to uh, report on the policies of the housing association. So as you see, this is a, a non-trivial process. And this non-trivial process can be described in a, in a very natural way uh, and a very abstract way um, in uh, this UML activity diagram. And the important thing here is that this is a diagram that is on the one hand useful for knowledge engineers like you guys. Uh, so you can use this to describe 
what's going on in the organization to determine which part of this process can be supported by knowledge technology. So it's useful for the knowledge engineer, but it's also readable by the experts. So you can discuss this diagram with people who work in the housing association and uh, uh, show them or show them this diagram and then ask them uh, whether uh, this is really how their organization works. So these diagrams are also a communication medium between the domain experts on the one hand and the knowledge engineers on the other hand. Um, here is another example of a, a diagnostic system. So what is diagnosis? Well, diagnosis is what a doctor does. Is it the doctor observes patient uh, symptoms from a patient and then tries to think of uh, diseases that could explain the symptoms. But diagnosis is also done what's is also what's done by an engineer, for example, the engineer of a photocopier or a car. So the engineer observes what's wrong with the car or with the photocopier, the symptoms, and then tries to think of a, a, a disease or an explanation or a fault of a, what is wrong with the car or the photocopier. And so at a very high level, diagnosing a patient or repairing a photocopier is, is exactly the same process. And again, we can describe this process in uh, an activity diagram. So uh, let's see uh, how we can describe this. Um, we start with an activity that's called a uh, cover. So uh, we take as input all the uh, observed uh, symptoms. And then in an uh, activity that's called cover, we try to uh, predict uh, which uh, causes uh, could uh, have predicted these symptoms. So if I see that my uh, patient has a fever as a symptom, then I would predict that this patient may have an infection. Um, now, if the patient has an infection, then they're also supposed to suffer from other symptoms. For example, their blood must have uh, certain values. Um, so based on the predicted causes i'm now go i'm based on the i'm going to sorry based on the suggested causes i'm going to predict a number of new symptoms that should also be true if my prediction is correct um, and once i have made these predictions i'm going to see in the obtain step uh, whether i can obtain these predictions so in short, once more, if I see that the patient um, has a fever, then I'm going to try to, in the cover step, going to say, well, the infection uh, diagnosis would cover the symptom fever. Uh, then I'm going to predict that if the patient has a fever, they must also have certain, uh, if the patient has an infection, sorry, the patient has an infection, they're also going to have certain blood values. Then I'm going to obtain these blood values. And then I'm going to compare the obtained blood values with the predicted blood values. And then if the result is indeed uh, equal between the prediction and, the, and the, uh, what I uh, obtained, then I think I have found the right solution. Otherwise, I have made the wrong prediction uh, and I should... Uh, uh, try to make another prediction. So a doctor uh, goes through this loop of predicting a particular uh, underlying disease, then obtaining symptoms to confirm or deny that hypothesis, then comparing the obtained results with the predicted results, and if the prediction is correct, we're done, and if not, then we have to continue. So you could also call this the Dr. House diagram. Right, so in the, in the famous television series, Dr. House, this is exactly what House and his team is always doing. Uh, so, whereas, so now we are describing what is going on inside a knowledge-based system. So whereas in the previous diagram, we were describing a process in an organization, right, in this diagram, we are describing the process inside a knowledge-based uh, system. And again, we can use this diagram to communicate with the domain experts. 
So even though we are talking about the inside of a knowledge-based system, this is still understandable for doctors or for photocopy engineers or for car mechanics. Right? So you can ask them, is this really a reasonable way of going about the process of doing a diagnosis? So this concludes uh, the description of our activity diagrams, which was one of the four diagrams that we're going to uh, discuss. So let's now turn to state diagrams.